Nothing is so familiar and taken for granted as groceries. And yet, these everyday items are consumed on such a scale that they are of enormous economic and therefore political importance. People have fought wars over the contents of a shopping basket. In fact, back in the middle of the 1700s, the very first truly world war was waged over just such a collection of basic commodities. This conflict has been called the Great War for Empire because it ranged halfway across the globe, from India to the Ohio Valley, and from the Caribbean to Quebec City. How did this Great War begin? Who was waging it? And what particular goods were they fighting over? This is the Schönbrunn Palace in Vienna, now famous for its musical performances, but once the summer residence of the Austrian Habsburgs. It is here that the Great War for Empire really began, when the last male Habsburg ruler, Charles VI, died in 1740 without leaving a male heir. He was succeeded instead by his daughter, Maria Theresa. A coalition of Austria's enemies, spearheaded by the Prussians, promptly challenged Maria Theresa's right to the throne as an excuse to invade Austrian territory. Thus began yet another war of succession. First it had been the English, then the Spanish. Now it was the war of the Austrian succession. And once again, France and Britain were to find themselves on opposite sides, with the French backing the Prussians and their allies, and the British siding with the Austrians and their supporters. But this new conflict between France and Britain, which was declared formally in 1744, was to have worldwide repercussions. Both colonial powers now had commercial interests in many parts of the globe, centered on the spices of the East Indies, the fish and fur and agricultural products of North America, and the sugar of the West Indies. Of all these goods, the Caribbean sugarcane was by far the most valuable. It was cultivated by tens of thousands of African slaves on such French-controlled islands as Martinique and Guadeloupe, and on British plantations in Barbados and Jamaica. This sugar crop yielded huge profits in the 1700s, making up a substantial proportion of the national incomes of France and Britain. In North America itself, France's most lucrative commodity was the fish caught off the east coast of Canada, plus, of course, that old standby on which Canada had been founded in the first place, fur, while Britain profited from such American crops as tobacco, rice, and wheat. On the other side of the world, in the East Indies, the main economic attraction for both the French and the British was a variety of exotic spices such as cinnamon, cloves, and pepper. One of the main reasons why spices were in such demand was because in those days, people didn't have refrigerators. So they had to use a lot of very strong seasoning to mask the taste of all the rotten meat they had to consume. Pepper, in particular, was such a cornerstone of commerce in the 1700s that the original stock exchange in London was quite literally built on pepper, since hundreds of bales of the stuff were stored under the exchange itself. This is what the Great War for Empire that was first sparked off in Austria in the 1740s was all about. A global tug of war over basic commodities that would continue on and off for the next 20 years finally reaching its climax here in Canada, with consequences that would change the face of the world. All because of a handful of groceries that might have been found on the shelves of any general store of that period. Fish and fur 
tobacco and rice, flour and grain, sugar and spice. A shopping list that reads like a nursery rhyme. The War of the Austrian Succession, by launching the Great War for Empire in the 1740s, also triggered the first major clash between Britain and France for over 30 years. But these two nations had been at peace with one another ever since the Treaty of Utrecht had brought an end to the previous war of the Spanish succession in 1713. Let's see what had been going on in North America during this lull in Anglo-French hostilities from 1713 to 1744, and how the outbreak of the war of the Austrian succession affected the situation. The Rockies, these mountains of bright stones, as the Indians called them, had been known to the native peoples for thousands of years. But they were only discovered by Europeans fairly recently, in 1743 to be precise, when the Canadian explorer Pierre Gautier Sieur de la Verandry sent two of his sons into what many historians believe was the northern Wyoming region, where they appear to have become the first white men to reach the Rockies. In this case, the range known as the Bighorn Mountains. To get here, the Lavarandres had traveled across most of the Great Plains. Their journey was partly a reaction to the Treaty of Utrecht. Because by confirming English control of the fur-bearing regions of the Hudson Bay Basin, this treaty had forced New France to extend its search for pelts further and further west. The Lavarandries had, in fact, started their expedition in 1731 at Lake Superior. Over the next 10 years, they built a chain of trading posts at Rainy Lake, Lake of the Woods, Red River, the Assiniboine River, Lake Winnipeg, and the Saskatchewan River. All this in addition to venturing south into Wyoming and catching a glimpse of the Rocky Mountains. But impressive as this achievement was, it was yet another example of New France dangerously overextending itself. Its relatively tiny population now laid claim to an even vaster region, which could only lead to trouble with its English rivals to the south, but the situation was exactly the reverse, with a very large and rapidly increasing population confined to a comparatively small area on the Atlantic coast. Such an unequal division of North America couldn't last forever, and the administrators of New France were fully aware of the precariousness of their position. This is why, in addition to the trading posts built by the Lavarandries, the Canadians spent much of the 30-year period of Anglo-French peace in North America, either building new guard posts or strengthening old ones, from New Orleans to Detroit, Niagara to Quebec to Louisburg, as well as up the Richelieu River to Lake Champlain. Many of these strongholds were now of ingenious design. Fort Chambly on the Richelieu, for instance, was built roughly in the shape of a star to allow its defenders to shelter from attack and catch the enemy in their crossfire. But the most important of all the French fortresses was, of course, the naval base of Louisbourg, which was intended to protect not only the St. Lawrence Passageway to Canada, but also the hundreds of French vessels which came each year to gather codfish off the Atlantic coast. So Louisburg was of great interest to the British, and when the War of the Austrian Succession brought an end to the Anglo-French peace in North America in 1744, the Cape Breton fortress was soon to find itself under attack. In the spring of the following year, a combined fleet of some 4,000 New England and British troops besieged Louisburg, and within a few weeks, it was forced to surrender. But this victory 
was to be short-lived. Because such local skirmishes were still part of a much larger global conflict. While the Lewisburg battle had been raging in North America, the French and the English had been fighting over another continent, India, where the British East India Company controlled such strategic posts as Calcutta, Bombay, and Madras. Madras, in particular, was an important center of the spice trade, and in 1746, the French succeeded in capturing it from the British. When both sides sat down to negotiate peace at the conclusion of the War of the Austrian Succession two years later, the usual swapping of conquered territories took place. And when it came to a choice between Canada and its codfish on the one hand, and India and its spices on the other, the British opted for the spices and gave Louisbourg back to the French in exchange for Madras. The peace negotiations that ended the war of the Austrian succession in 1748 may have left British and French holdings in North America much as before, but this was only the first phase of the great war for empire. It was soon to be followed by a second and much more decisive phase. If you had visited the Appalachians in the late 1740s, you might have seen small groups of fur traders and land speculators from Virginia and Pennsylvania passing through narrow crevices in the mountains on their way to lay claim to the rich, fertile soil of the Ohio Valley. It was the arrival of this vanguard of what would later turn into a flood of American settlers that brought about the final imperial showdown between Britain and France. The French maintained that the Ohio Valley belonged to New France. Because, according to them, it had been discovered by La Salle in the 1670s. And they certainly didn't want the English there, since this would give them access to the French territory of Louisiana. Until now, the English colonies on the Atlantic coast had been cut off from the Ohio Valley by the formidable Appalachians, which were like a gigantic dam, holding back the rising tide of British settlement on the eastern seaboard. But in the late 1740s, certain adventurous Englishmen, or rather Americans, as they had now begun to think of themselves, began to make breaches in this dam by discovering gaps in the mountains. The most famous of these was the Cumberland Gap, which was located in 1748. As soon as the Americans began to spill down into the Ohio Valley, the French responded with another flurry of fort building to defend their position in the area. The Americans countered by sending a young Virginian officer by the name of George Washington to order the French Canadians out of the Ohio Valley. But the Canadian guerrilla fighters, in combination with their local Indian allies, easily routed Washington and his men, and in 1754 forced the Virginians back over the Appalachians. It was this Canadian-American clash in the Ohio Valley that launched the second and last phase of the Great War for Empire. Once again, it was a conflict of commodities, fur and farm products. The Canadians wanted to protect their fur-bearing territory, while the Americans had their eye on the agricultural potential of the region. But this French and Indian War, as it came to be called, was to spread far beyond the Ohio Valley, not only throughout North America, but also to the Caribbean, and to India, as well as to Europe itself. This was a complete reversal of the usual pattern. The North American aspect of all the previous Anglo-French conflicts ever since 1689 had always been a byproduct of what was going on in Europe. This time, it was the other way round. 
The main event was here. The sideshow was in Europe. Two years after the French and Indian War broke up, the ensuing hostility between Britain and France drew both nations once again into dynastic squabbles centered on Austria, with Britain now backing the Prussians and France supporting the Austrians. We know this European conflict as the Seven Years' War, because it lasted from 1756 to 1763. But it would be more accurate to call it the Nine Years' War, because it really started in 1754 in North America, along the banks of the Ohio, where for the first time, the New World called the Old to arms. If we were to look for the greatest tragedy in Canadian history as a whole, there's no doubt that it would be the elimination of something like 90% of our native peoples as a result of European contact. But it could be argued that the greatest tragedy to befall European Canadians themselves was an event that took place in the mid-1750s, following the outbreak of the French and Indian War. Britain's reaction to the Canadian-American clash in the Ohio Valley that launched the French and Indian War in 1754 was to send out the following year several regiments of redcoats. These regular British soldiers were to combine with American colonial troops to attack New France on three fronts. In the west, in the Ohio Valley. In the center, in the Lake Champlain Richelieu River corridor leading up to Canada itself, and in the east, in the Maritimes. Initially, the Canadians and their Indian allies, supported by regular troops from France, were victorious over the British and the Americans in the Ohio Valley and managed to hold them at bay on Lake Champlain. But in the Maritimes, it was a different story. Although the Acadian Peninsula, now known as Nova Scotia, had been a British colony ever since the Treaty of Utrecht, relatively few people from either Britain or New England had come to settle here. The overwhelming majority of the population still consisted of French Acadians. In fact, the Acadians had flourished to such an extent that by the middle of the 1700s, there were over 10,000 of them in the Maritimes. They were the descendants of the French settlers who had first started to arrive in this region in substantial numbers in the mid-1600s and who could trace their claim to the area all the way back to Champlain and the founding of Port Royal in 1605. Over the years, the Acadians had evolved a quite distinctive way of life, devising a very efficient system of dikes to reclaim the Nova Scotian marshes for farmland, as well as an equally efficient trading network, not only with the local Mi'kmaq Indians, but also with the merchants of New England. But the very distinctiveness of the Acadians was to be their downfall. For by the 1750s, they found themselves in the middle, neither 100% with the French, nor 100% against the British. Ever since 1713, the British authorities at Annapolis Royal had tried in vain to persuade their Acadian subjects to swear an oath of allegiance to Great Britain. But the Acadians had always refused, since this would have entailed taking sides against the French. To make matters even more awkward for the British, the powerful fortress of Louisbourg just off the coast of Nova Scotia was now in French hands again having been given back to them in 1748. The British had reacted to this by building the port of Halifax in 1749 as a counterweight to Louisbourg. But when the French and Indian War broke out five years later, they still felt very vulnerable in the Maritimes. So much so that the British decided the only way to safeguard their position in this region was to get rid of the potentially dangerous Acadians once and for all. Accordingly, 
in 1755, the final solution to the Acadian problem was put into effect. The wholesale deportation of almost the entire Acadian population. In that year alone, nearly 7,000 people were rounded up and dispatched to the American colonies or to the Caribbean. Some managed to escape to Canada or to France, and a few later succeeded in returning to the Maritimes. But by 1762, the original Acadian population of this region, which had once numbered over 10,000 people, had been reduced to a few hundred survivors. Eventually, quite a large group of Acadians found a home in Louisiana, where the word Acadian was gradually transformed into Cajun, and where many of their descendants today still manage to preserve a Cajun culture, a legacy of the tragic events that took place in Nova Scotia a little over 200 years ago. The expulsion of the Acadians in 1755 was one of the few examples of the English gaining the upper hand in North America in the early years of the French and Indian War. On almost all the other battlefronts, victory went to the French. But in 1758, the tide turned with a vengeance. And from then on, the British and American forces on this continent were to have things nearly all their own way. If there was one factor that accounted for the sudden change in English fortunes in the French and Indian War, it was this army. But these weren't British or American soldiers. They were Germans from the Kingdom of Prussia. By the middle of the 1700s, the Prussian army was the best in Europe, and it was under the command of the greatest military genius of the age, the King of Prussia himself, Frederick the Great. But none of these Prussian soldiers ever actually fought against the French in North America. Instead, they helped the English cause on this continent by fighting the French back in Europe. As the British Prime Minister of the time, William Pitt, was to predict, America would be conquered in Germany. How this came about was as follows. After the onset of the Seven Years' War in Europe in 1756, Britain had joined ranks with Prussia against Austria and France. And this offered a solution to one of the perennial problems in her battles with France. Although the British Navy was much larger than the French Navy, when it came to land forces, it was the other way round. The French army was 10 times bigger than the British one. But now that Britain had the powerful Prussian army on her side, this changed everything. Pitt agreed to support Frederick with money rather than with men, so that Prussia would do most of Britain's fighting for her in Europe. This would not only tie down nearly all the French forces there, but also free a large proportion of the British forces to sail to North America to overwhelm the relatively few troops that France could spare from her battles with the Prussians. The plan worked. By 1758, the British troops in North America outnumbered the French by four to one. Soon, New France was to lose stronghold after stronghold. Louisbourg, Fort Frontenac, Fort Duquesne in the Ohio Valley, Fort Niagara, plus various fortifications on Lake Champlain. The way was now open for an all-out attack on Canada itself from three different directions. The high point of all this drama was the siege of Quebec in the summer of 1759 when the British bombarded the city for over two months. Finally, in September of that year, led by a regiment of the Fraser Highlanders, 
some 4,500 British soldiers scaled the cliffs below the Plains of Abraham, just outside Quebec City. Here, under the command of General Wolfe, they came face to face with almost as many French troops, led by General Montcalm. Fifteen minutes, it was all over. General Wolfe leading his British attacking force was mortally wounded. Montcalm, the French commander, suffered a similar fate. But Quebec itself fell to the British. A year later, in 1760, Montreal was also captured forcing the capitulation of New France to Britain. A new age was about to begin in Canada's history, the age of British North America. But there was an ironic twist to this great conquest. Canada was very nearly handed back to the French a few years later. Yet again, the reason for this centered on groceries. The most sought-after commodity in all of the great war for empire was not Canadian fish or fur or even East Indian spices. It was the sugar of the Caribbean. Here, the richest prize of all was the tiny island of Guadeloupe, the most prolific producer of sugar cane in the whole of the West Indies. Like almost every other former French colony, Guadeloupe was now in British hands. But at the peace negotiations, which led up to the eventual conclusion of the war in 1763, Britain was obliged to make some concessions to France. This generated much debate as to the relative merits of Guadeloupe with its immensely rich sugar plantations, and Canada, which the French philosopher Voltaire had contemptuously written off as a few acres of snow. So, Guadeloupe became French once more, and Canada remained British. If it came to a choice between sugar and snow, France preferred sugar. <laughs> 